we are not alone. These are supposed to be some of the most verified images of giants. People who do meditation for 60 days will lengthen their telomeres. Soon we'll get results. And we'll let you know right here on Beyond Belief. Things seem to be changing in the field of ufology. It's going to be a bumpy ride. That's priceless. Isn't that amazing? Tesla wanted free energy. And look what happened to him. We have evidence to show that they're real. The real question is how and why. There were Egyptian hieroglyphs out in the outback of Australia. In Australia. What are the possibilities Mars was inhabited? And these were built. We almost can't duplicate today. These are amazing topics. What if there was something like an Area 51 deep underwater? They were killed by some animal. Believe me. We're just getting started. I'm George Norrie, and we here at Gaia are committed to revealing the truth. Thank you for joining us tonight. You're listening to Coast to Coast AM. If you would like to find me other than Coast to Coast AM, please do at ConnieWillis.com. I'd love for you to join me in my other shows, Blue Rock Talk and Connie After Dark. Those are membership shows, communities. They are both very different. They are both very fun. And the people that are in them are the best of the best. So thank you again for joining us. Merry Christmas. Here's one of the gifts of knowledge. Robert Treat is who uh, I'm talking about. He's going to be discussing, well, we'll figure that out, won't we? He is a private military government contractor, U.S. Navy special warfare veteran in need and also ready to tell some stories. So, Robert, well, not stories. I don't want to say that word when when you're here to tell what you what it is you want to tell so robert first of all thank you and welcome to coast to coast am well thank you for having me connie it uh i'm deeply honored to be on coast to coast it's uh um, been one of my favorite um, radio shows for many many years since uh, mark bell and here you are never thinking you would be on it probably and never thinking you would be on it this way now tell us about your health first of all and your situation well um suffered a uh, medication reaction um to an injury i sustained a long time ago I had to have a shoulder replacement and all that but what it led to was um a serious chain of blockages starting right below my heart all through my abdominal aorta and down through my iliac arteries and uh, it's just a matter of time before either the big aneurysm below my heart pops or um, it just the, the pressure just makes my heart give out um, there is there is a chance for survival um, by having the abdominal aorta completely replaced um, and that's going to require quite a long recovery period and even though the, the VA, which is a great organization, they're going to do the surgery, um, which is the brutal part. But the uh, the things that go along with the surgery, mainly, uh, you know, who takes care of your apartment or your 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 pets, or if you're completely alone in the world like I am now, um, you know, as you come out of the hospital from a six month recovery, there's nowhere to go. Um, so I'm. Uh, launched the uh, GoFundMe to try and take care of those um, those little slight expenses while I'm laid up for that uh, five to six month recovery period in the hospital, so that um, you know I'll still have a life to come home to. And you also have some critters at home, right? Yeah, I've got three rescue dogs. I've got uh, two huskies and a pit bull. Um, there were all three rescues, um, two of them from a, a dog fighting place that I rescued them from. And oh. the little pit bull just wandered up to my house one day. Oh, <laughs> uh, he could tell that aura around you. Um, if you ever met Robert, uh, he was an incredible businessman and also an entirely um, a huge background 
that even when you were married, your wife had no idea about at the time. And I don't know if she ever has. But anyway, Robert Treat, we're hoping to help you get things done that you need to get done. I know the more it's amazing. The more important thing he's worried about is not himself, but his three dogs, his girls, as he calls them. Is that right? Am I right on that? They're the biggest concern um, yeah. as to what's going to happen to them. Um, you know, I don't have uh, I don't have children of my own, no family, no no close friends, and you know, I go to uh, every day just to worry about you know what would happen to them if something happened to me. It, there'd be nobody to find me for you know days or weeks, and um, you know, they're my little family. I got to look out for them. Well, tell us, I think that's nice. Tell us about your background. When I say a private, want to say private military government contractor, U.S. Navy special warfare veteran, it's hard to, to pick a spot to talk about learning Robert Treat because there's, it actually starts at the very beginning. Maybe, you know, here I want to know about the credibility of your background, but it really starts as a child, as a baby. So first of all, let's just tell people your background um, service-wise. Well, service-wise, um, I was 17 years old, basically a homeless teenager at the time. Um, not long, like I hadn't been on the streets a long time, but a few days. And it was winter time in Oklahoma, it was cold, and I was uh, walking by a recruiter's office and uh, I hear this Marine yell, hey, kid, you know, would you like a cup of coffee? Come in and get warm. So being naive to recruiter tactics, I was like, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll come in and um, ended up hanging out there most of the night. And uh, the recruiter asked me if I'd like to join the Marine Corps. You know, almost teenager. I was like, sure, why not? So took the test. Um, and uh, he actually put me up at his home um, while we waited for my test results to come back. And the day that my results came back, I uh, walked on down to the uh, recruiter's office, and there were multiple recruiters in this strip mall. Um, you had every every branch, you know, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. And um, I walked into the Marine Corps office, and the um, sergeant that was uh, my recruiter, he's like, uh, you know, there's a senior chief from the Navy that needs to talk to you. He's like, just wait here. So a few minutes later, the senior chief walks in, senior chief Goins, and he informs me that I'd scored incredibly high on uh, the ASFAB and that the, the Department of the Navy was taking my recruitment from the Marine Corps. So I was going off to Great Lakes, Illinois for basic training. And that's where the journey started. Because you didn't, you didn't. You 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 joined the Navy. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah. I went off to the Navy, and they gave me my started. choice of uh, well, they gave me two choices for what they call A school, which is your your main career path in the military. And um, they offered me a gas turbines nuke school, and they offered me operations specialist. And I went with operations specialist because I'm electronically inclined and. You know, a little leery about nuclear, you know, working around nukes. So I went with that, completed, you know, basic training, um, and was off to Dam Neck, Virginia, uh, to become an operations specialist. Um, graduated top of my class there, which meant I got my choice of duty stations, and I naturally chose Hawaii. I mean, what, you know, teenage man wouldn't? Hello, exactly, or any age, hello, <laughs> male or female. <laughs> So off I go, freshly graduated operations specialist with the Navy, and I'm off to Pearl Harbor. You know, the trip out there was a disaster. Delayed flights, ended up, you know, hopping Mack flights across the country to get there, six hours on a C-130 in a jump seat. It was just a disaster all the way. And when I got to my duty station, which I was assigned to um, Destroyer Squadron 25, um, they had way overbilleted the number of OSs they needed. So um, while they were trying to figure out a place to put me, they uh, started shipping me off to every C school they could think of. In a C school, 
is like a secondary education. Like after you get your, your main rate, they'll send you to other schools to either advance that rate or learn other things. Um, and I went to, you know, firefighting school and uh, I ended up in what was called target motion analysis, which is uh, submarine hunting. And mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a class at the school. Very few pass with an understanding of what it is. And I, I just took to it real well and ended up rolling straight into advanced target motion analysis and uh, subsequently becoming an instructor for the TMA attack team. Well, just real quick to go back to it. So what is it? Isn't it just finding submarines under the water or is it's it something finding, different? Yeah, it's finding enemy submarines, submerged, you know, um, first strike submarines. Um, without using active sonar. So you just listen to the ocean. And when you catch one, when you pick one up, you track it just passively through, you know, screw noise, cavitation, any noise it makes, you track it. And over a period of time, I mean, sometimes hours, um, you'll end up developing a pattern. And through that pattern, you can determine the submarine's depth, its course, its speed, and its closest point of approach to your vessel. And with those pieces of information, you can program the two weapons that we had available to us in, in Desron 2.5, which was the Basset and the Bulldog. You can program those torpedoes to intercept that enemy submarine without it ever knowing that you're actively hunting it. Mm. Wow. And, and that's an element. Naval special warfare, most people just associate with the SEALs or UDT, underwater demolitions teams. But naval special warfare is a huge um part of the Navy. It's, mm-hmm. It encompasses so many departments. Um, I'm still yeah. amazed at knowing what I know about you and then just looking back as you're continuing to talk and, and I'm just seeing how you're, it's almost like you're placed here, then you're placed here. It's like why I made a deal of you, you know, you, you went in to be in the Marines, but then you went into the Navy. <laughs> you know, it's almost like, okay, you're trying to move forward, but we're going to place you over here. It's something, something bigger. It seems to be placing you pl- places where they want. I don't know if you recognize that or or do you recognize that looking back? Oh, yeah. I very much feel that my life has never been my own. Um, it seems like absolutely everything I've ended up in, every project, every conspiracy, everything I've ever ended up with seemed like a, a, a serendipity or a horrible accident. Like, there's nothing I ever chose. It was... Um, if somebody asked me if I could do something, the answer was always going to be yes. And even if I didn't know how to do it, I was going to figure it out and I was going to make it happen. And um, that became the cornerstone of my entire life. What was the time, where was it that you got your uh, IQ test tested and what was that? Uh, the first one, I was 10 years old. Um, we, we traveled around the world a lot, so every six to 12 months, I was in a new school district, usually in a new country, and um, <clears throat> they would test me to place me in whatever grade. And the first IQ test I took, I was 10 years old because they were trying to decide where to put me uh, because I'd started first grade when I was three, and that was in Tehran, Iran. Um, and in that country, you start school when you can complete the basic um, entry-level requirements for first grade, you know, uh, write your name, go to the bathroom by yourself, you know, basic <laughs> stuff. Here in America, Little three-year-old going on 50. <laughs> yeah. So here in America, at six years old, at six years old, that's when you start first grade. But in Tehran, you know, if you're if you're old enough and your parents are wanting to pack you off, then you, you go when you're, when you're capable. And for me, that was three. Wow. So by the time I was 10, we were, um, you know, we were living in Scotland, and they were determining you know, do we put him um, with his age group or with his education level? So they tested me, and part of that was an IQ test uh, as well as a behavioral test. But the IQ test came, came back at 212, and that was a 10. Mm. <laughs> and what's the norm? I think that, I think the average human IQ is 80. <laughs> you are not from this world already. Okay. So... Did you get tested again and it was higher at one point or did you ever? I've been tested uh, numerous times on my IQ and it's ranged um, 
because I, the IQ tests are, are subjective. And um, I took one when I was massively hungover, and I mean wicked hungover, and that was a 188. <laughs> and I took another one when I was, uh, um, you know, feeling real good, and they didn't uh, they didn't give me the exit the number. They just said it was upward of 230. Oh my! <laughs> yeah. And, oh. Um, I mean, that's excessively, excessively high. And, uh, you know, I actually ended up seeing a psychologist after um, some of those higher tests because I was worried. You know, they say that um, high IQ can be an indication of, you know, like a, a mental dysfunction or a mental illness. Um, so I wanted to be I wanted to be tested to make sure there was nothing wrong with me or if there was something wrong with me, I needed to know what it was, but. The test came back with nothing other than an, an anxiety disorder, and I was like, well, no kidding. Of course, I have an anxiety <laughs> disorder. <laughs> and, and you know, this is who you are. I mean, how do you know that it's even different than anybody else? You know, I uh, – and, wow. Okay, so – I thought that was important to add because I know you were, so you became, you started instructing it with the Navy and uh, I'll let you go from there. Uh, yeah. So my career with the Navy was really unremarkable. Um, there were a lot of odd things, which I didn't really, you know, click to at the time that I was always assigned to things well out of my rate. Um, you know, I'm rated as an operations specialist, which is, you know, glorified radar operator really. Um, you know, working in anti-submarine warfare, which was, you know, nice to have something to put my mind on. But my commanding officer was always giving me jobs well outside of my clearance level. I had a top secret. Um, I had an eyes only. But, you know, these classifications, when you get above top secret eyes only, are compartmentalized. That's why it appears to be so many, you know, clearance levels. You know, be top secret eyes only and then the project name or, you know, the, the whatever it is that you're related to. If you're, you know, part of that project, part of that unit, part of that operation, then, you know, if you have need to know, then you can see it. Um, well, I didn't have clearance. My security clearance didn't extend to reading the private, the captain's private communications in Radio Central. But they were always having me work Radio Central or go in there for you know, various things. And my commanding officer, my lieutenant would regularly ask my advice on, on things that really I had no business providing input into. Um, bear in mind, at, at this time, you know, I'm barely old enough to drink. I may not even be 21 yet. Um, you know, so I'm an E3, E4. You know, that that's how low down the totem pole I am. And, and why officers are talking to me, seeking my advice. All this seemed a very uh, unusual thing to me. Um, but I was happy to discuss whatever they wanted to discuss. And um, that led to me being, um, I ended up at the SYNCPAC building, which is the uh, the headquarters for Pearl Harbor, all of 7th Fleet, all 7th Fleet's operations, submarine operations, everything. It's run out of SYNCPAC. So I'm going down there on a fairly regular basis, and I'm about three years into my into my tour here. And um, when I'm not training, when I'm teaching classes out on Fort Island for the uh, target motion analysis attack team, um, I would be down at the sink pack building, and uh, quite often talking with the admiral. And we go over several different things. Um, you know, uh, special warfare projects that were going on related to anti-submarine warfare, whether it's new helicopter systems, new sonar buoy systems, new ways of laying down sonar buoy patterns, um, uh, yeah, ULF communications, various things like that, submarine fleet deployment. Um, and like I said, why they're asking my advice or my opinions or even consulting me at all is a very strange thing to be occurring in the military. Um Somebody of my age and rank is really waxing floors, not talking with the admiral or talking with any of the captains at Sink Pack. And um, really, I think I got their attention. One of the things they had me look at, and remember I said earlier that Naval Special Warfare and the, and the Department of the Navy in general is a huge, huge organization, far bigger than anybody can imagine. Um 
So one of the projects that the Navy was looking at, and everything is important to them, whether it's um, technology or what's going on in Washington, bills that are being put through. You know, so one of the bills, I, one of the things I looked at was the universal health care plan, and they asked my to me for me to write an opinion letter on it, so I did. Um, but I think the one that really got the attention was the proposed fusion reactor that was um, being proposed to be built, which is fusion, which is like the sun versus fission, like a nuclear bomb. And, um, you know, I pointed out some things that didn't make sense to me um, and wrote a report on that. And it wasn't long after that when I started being contacted by other agencies. Hmm. And who were they? Well, I was, uh, when I was pulled in and given a, a psychic battery of tests to see if I had psychic abilities, which I didn't, I barely scored higher than, than guessing. Um, and the other one was somebody that turned out to be my lifelong best friend. He's a CIA officer who I just refer to as Glenn. So you were taken, so somebody pulled you in and you did some psych... <laughs> you loser, you have a IQ of what, and, but you can't do any psychic stuff? I, that is hilarious because I know you love to take tests and you actually failed on these. That's amazing for you. So so you didn't do well on the psychic test and the guy, but what happens at the end of that? I, I, I'm only asking you that because I actually know the story here and I think it's incredible. Well, I, I pretty much did you know, average or slightly better than average on all of the psychic tests they did, which was, you know, um, guess the symbol on the card and, you know, um, remote viewing and, and all that stuff. I didn't do well on that. The last thing he took me through was a meditation exercise. And the ultimate goal was what he called the blue pearl. If you could find, if you could envision and, and stabilize um, what he called the blue pearl, and you go through a series of steps, you know, starting with learning how to meditate in color, um, which you think you can do that. But to really see a vivid color, to imagine a color is one thing, but to actually see it in your mind vividly is something else. Hmm. So we go through these steps and they're going we're going through them very, very rapidly. The first session. And um, he had told me that, you know, once we could start down that rabbit hole, that you will see what looks like just empty space, just a void. And in the void, you will see a blue pearl. And um, he didn't really expect me to reach that point in one session. That's kind of like years or a lifetime of training to, to do that. And it happened for me very, very quickly, probably within 20 or 30 minutes. Mm. And he pulled me out of it right away, gave me a warning, never, ever attempt that again. Um, he said, if you, and this is all I know. I don't know why. He never gave me an explanation. He just said, if you go beyond the blue pearl, there's a chance that you will not come back. You won't want to come back. And um, he ushered me out of the office, out of the building, which was the, the famous Hawaii Five O building, downtown Honolulu. Mm. And um, there was no follow-up scheduled. And it, it felt, he didn't say get out, but it very much felt like a get out. So what happened after that to where you met Glenn? Oh, I was, uh, it wasn't long after that, maybe a week, maybe two. Um, when I was uh, down this little street called Hotel Street, which is where everybody drank, you know, back then. Um, all the squids drank down there. Um, they didn't card you. They didn't ID you. So, you know, that's where all of us underage drinkers went. And um, <laughs> with this little bar called Two Jacks. And uh, this little Asian guy um, sits down next to me, dead ringer for Mr. Miyagi, too. Um, I never told you that before. but look. I was just going to say that, but I thought, no, I better stay away from that. <laughs> here, here he is, wax on, wax off, right next to me. <laughs> and um, he just starts talking to me. And we're just casually, you know, just BSing throughout the night. You know, as the bars are getting ready to, you know, shut down for the evening, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, we leave and we go drive off in his car. We end up down at Waikiki, and that's when he starts telling me about, you know, who he is, who he works for, what he does. 
Um, he was an officer for the officer for the CIA, which means he was an actual, you know, employee got his paycheck from the agency. And what's the difference, officer? What say that again with with the CIA? Well, the officers are the ones who actually work for the CIA, right? Okay. There is no such thing, technically, as a CIA agent. Um, an agent is an asset of an officer. It's when the officers they cultivate, you know, a civilian, or you know, could be you know a, a foreign person or you know foreign government official. But anybody who doesn't work for the CIA becomes an agent of an officer. So, are you an agent? Um, technically, by definition, yes. From time to time, um, you know, Glenn would set me up on on jobs, which I was happy to do because the pay was good. And you know, as a civilian, or if you're in the military, and you're doing side jobs for the CIA for an officer, you know, during that period, you are an agent. Um, and you know, quite often that's um, going to be a non-official cover, what they call knock. So if you get caught doing whatever dirty thing it is they want you to do, you're on your own. Mm. They, will not, they will not come save you. They're like, oh, you have no idea who that guy is. Never heard of him, right? Um, you know, so they'll they'll support you and they'll bankroll you for whatever it is they're asking you to do, but they do not have your back. Oh my! So you do that? You take that risk because the money's so good? Yes. Oh. You know, and I had a, you know an expensive family. Um, you know, kids in private school and um, private Christian school, which is not cheap. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when I would get an offer, you know, hey, do this job, there's 30 grand in it for you. Yes. You know, especially when I'm making barely $2,000 on my Navy paycheck. Mm. And, uh, you know, my adventures with Glenn um, started out fair, you know, fairly benign. Um just going in wrangling projects and, you know, making sure that all the uh, disparate parts and players in that project, you know, get along and it, you know, comes off on time and on budget. Um, you know, when the, the government is bankrolling a project, and this is how a great many things are done, is, and why you don't find a lot of government records on these secret projects and how do they you know, run the black fund, how do they, you know, keep all these projects from reaching the public eye? It's very simple. They contract it all out to civilian companies. So there's no government record. Interesting. So can you tell about some of these things? It's kind of like you did a project, you did a project, you did a project, and then at one point you started seeing how they connected and how you were a part of, whoa, wait a minute, I'm a part of this. Yeah, but before – well, before that, you are like the cooler. You are the guy that pulls everything together. Right. Um, and they, they seem benign projects, and, I, and some of the early ones even, I saw them you know, reconnecting back later, you know, later in life. Mm. Um, yeah, I worked on gas detection systems for the uh, uh, Umatilla Reserve, which is where we stored nerve gas. Um, I worked on a starch-based um, super absorbent for agricultural reclamation in Africa. Um, I worked on some uh, genetic engineering for um, reclaiming nuclear uh, nuclear waste and rubber waste, and that was training bacteria um, to do what you want them to do, whether you know, it's recycling tires, you train the bacteria to eat sulfur length of tire, you can train bacteria to eat almost anything. Oh my, this is government stuff or it's private sector? It, it it's private, it's government funded, which um means a percentage of the technology ends up in the in the, the public sector, in the private sector, the real world. And what the government military wants to keep for themselves, they uh they black bag that and it gets absorbed into another project. Mm. So you know, even even a legitimate project, say an environmental project, almost anything, no matter how benign it may seem, there may be a piece in there that's being worked on as part of another project. So when it comes to these top secret, high-level top secret programs, the elements of it are spread around across so many companies with so many, you know, each company only having a little piece. No one can ever figure it out, you know, from one little element. 
you know, when you get a dozen, two dozen, three dozen projects in, you start seeing these elements repeating and popping up. Like, why is why is that from five years ago popping up into this project, which isn't even related? Ah. Uh-huh. And, and how old are you at this time? You're pretty young. Oh yeah, I'm probably 24 when I. <laughs> Jeez. First okay. Land. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so the project where it really things really got a weird and took a turn for me was when they asked me if um, I would take over this project in Montana. Um, it was being run by uh, an organization called Troika, and uh, it was a refinery to create what was then a theoretical isotope uh, called osmium-187. And there was massive competition, like they were really up against the time limit because the Russians were claiming they had already produced a stable osmium-187. And they were desperate to get um, the scientists, um, the independent investors, because there's always a bank or some private money group involved in addition to the government money. Um, Government never staked anything 100%, um, hardly ever. So we have investors, we have Pentagon people, and we have the scientists all working on the project. They're all arguing about who's in charge. So Glenn asked me if I would go in there and take that over and kind of be, you know, Wyatt Earp and get everybody back to work. So I did. First day there, it was like new sheriff in town. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to get done. And um, within a few weeks, we got the flow through columns and all the technology installed and started refining product. And um, in the meantime, we're also investigating whether or not the Russian product is any good. It turned out it wasn't. The Russians were lying, as usual, um, and that their uh, their product was actually bred from a foreign parent body. So, you know, we fast-tracked it and pushed that refinery so, uh, so fast we came out way ahead of schedule, years ahead of schedule. And, uh, now, produced, and we now produced just... the first uh, stable gram of um, osmium-187. Okay, and what that is because of having you on Connie Willis, the podcast, in the segments, I I have heard this from you, um, and I found it extremely interesting that th- this product basically is, like, better than gold. Um, yes, it, it has a very specific purpose. It, it, from what I was told, what they were using it for was um, space-based electronics because it was extremely conductive when mixed with other metals. Um, it would almost superconduct at any temperature. You know, it didn't have to be super cooled. Um, it would almost superconduct at ambient temperatures, and it also had incredible strength. Um, so they were also using it for armor systems, and. Um, I saw the designs on the armor, and they said it was for the uh, A1 um, Abrams tank. And I'm like, those panels don't look like they belong in an Abram tank. Um, so when I started hearing about the secret space program, I'm, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but I'm betting that that, that armor tech we worked on um, was made for the skin of some kind of satellite or spacecraft. Coast to Coast AM, Connie Claus here. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Christmas to you. Find me at ConnieWillis.com. Join my podcast and follow even more of the story of what we're talking about tonight with Robert Treat. He is discussing his world while in the intelligence field, giving us the gift of truth concerning why the ET are here. This is a live deathbed confession by a private military government contractor and U.S. Navy Special Warfare veteran. We do have on the Coast to Coast AM website his um, GoFundMe site. He's looking to raise $12,000. He is currently at $4,583. Thank those of you that have already given and appreciate the support for him on this. Uh, And and Robert, we appreciate that you are here. Also, you can go to robtreat.com and sign up for his email list, robtreat.com, to update you uh, while he can and with the information of how things are going for him. So, Rob, you know, again, time flies here. So 
I want you to definitely finish what we were talking about before we had to take the break. And then um, we're going to have to skip a lot to uh, get out some information. Yes. And I just want to take a moment to, to say thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for those who have donated to my GoFundMe. It um, means more to me than I could ever express. Um, I'm happy you're with us because when I was first talking to you, you said you just had a couple of weeks and here you still are. But I think you said it could happen at any time. Is that correct? Just out of the blue or is it more of a gradual? Well, my, uh, my cardiologist said I'd be lucky to make it to the end of the year. And that was why I reached out to you because, you know, it could happen any night or any day. Um, and uh I'm terrified about falling, you know, dying when I fall asleep. I at least want to be awake when it happens. <laughs> so the money is to take care of a home so you can get into the surgery, see how that goes. And this is going to take care of the payment of your house so you'll, or, or your apartment so that you can come back to something. Also take care of your animals without boarding them, but somebody actually taking care of them for you. Yes. Yeah, all the, the things associated with the surgery. The VA will, will do the operation, but they don't take care of any of the um, the things that go along with that. Um, and I don't have a family, uh, close friends, you know, no relatives here. And um, it's going to take, you know, even a considerable amount of time on the disability claim. Um, you know, it, they're telling me they're about a year backlog, so that's going to be a long battle in itself, but um, the, the the help you guys have contributed on the GoFundMe is, is just enormous, and I'm immensely grateful for that. And Robert, why are you wanting to do this? Why are you wanting to tell some things that you've experienced? I just feel it's really important. I, I, I'd hoped, you know, by the time I got to this age, that there would have been some degree of disclosure that credible people would have come forward. Um, and they just haven't. It just it just hasn't come out. You know the real reason behind stuff. Um, you know all the movies, all the rehashing of old fuzzy photos from thirty, forty, fifty years ago. And it, it's interesting. And um, you know, it's, it's great work for the research of the topic. Um, but I feel like we're running out of time um, for the end game, which I, I really, based on my career, I think we're. We're not far from the end game, maybe a few years at best. And um, if nobody else was going to say it, then I'll say it. Here's Here you go. Here's your platform. Here's your time. So, you know, we talk, We were talking about, you know, my time at, uh, at the Osmium Refinery um, under Troika. And over the, the next 20 years, I worked on a huge variety of, of all kinds of projects, which we could we could do a whole show just on that. But the reason I, I really focus on my time there was um, several pivotal things happened that changed everything. Um, one, I became a actual member of Troika, and there's only three people. Um, there was you know Glenn, who I mentioned. There was Randolph, and there was Mike. Well, Mike left to go to a different project, and um, they asked me to take his place on Troika, so I did. And that launched in the next 20 years was an insane ride of some projects you just wouldn't believe. Um, when I said it encompasses a lot, it encompasses a lot. Um, but I'm focusing on my time there because of what happened. Um, I was, I went topside. This was an underground facility. I went topside to smoke a cigarette. Yes, I still smoked back then. Um, I went topside, and, and uh, you know, I remember thinking, you know, this is the kind. I looked up at the sky in Montana, thinking this is the kind of place people get abducted, and that's exactly what happened to me that night. And I'd been taken before as a child, from age five to age fourteen. Um, I was a, a regular abductee, but I don't consider that abductions more like a rescue um, or vacation because the aliens I encountered as a child were very benevolent, very loving, and you know, I considered them family. But what happened that night at Troika, the ones I was taken with were the ones I'd heard about but never encountered. And 
I knew I'd known from the time I was a child that there were two camps of the Greys. And within the Greys, there's multiple speed. It's not like a ubiquitous. They're not all short. There's several different classes, several different types of Greys. You know, whether you call them races or what. Um, And there was another camp, which they referred to as the Fallen. Um, these are the closest words in, in our language. I think a lot gets lost in translation, but the closest word in our language would be Fallen, the Fallen, the Fallen Ones. And those are the greys that um, apparently a very, very long time ago, probably tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years by our score, there was a war between the greys and the side that were defeated, I mean, you can call them rebels. Um, it seems overly simplistic, but you know, if you want to call them the rebels, were defeated. <laughs> and um, they no longer have the means to leave our solar system. They're here on Earth. And uh, over the eons that they've been here, they've degraded. Um, they despise humanity. Um, they work with um, the power elite humans, the greedy humans. And those are the ones that sell themselves outright to these things. I mean, you know, you see lightning raises and, um, you know, from rags to riches, from being a mediocre businessman to being a multi-billion, you know, billionaire powerhouse. You know, how do these people make it? You know, they find themselves inside. They sell themselves out. And they sell themselves out for data. They sell themselves out for mind control. And, you know, they do. Um you know, I'm sure a lot of uh, listeners have heard about, you know, um, Operation Mockingbird um, or Mockingjay, where they uh, uh, use programming through the media, through TV commercials, through entertainment, through um, all kinds of things, through marketing uh, to influence the way people think. And all that's real. It's very real. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. But I'd heard about the fall when, when I was you know, taken by the others as a child. And that night at Troika was when I got to encounter them up close and personal. And, yeah, so when I hear people talking about horrible experiences, terrifying experiences, those are the ones. It's the fallen. Um, anybody who gets abducted that's had an absolute nightmare, um, they were taken by the fallen, not by the other ones, which I, I, I call them the primarchs. Um, they're very, very different races, very, very different um, groups. When you when you say the archons, they're the greys, and there's good and bad, and then you say, uh, is that is that right? Or the primarchs, they're the mantids. What most people say, call the mantids. Yeah, they're the ones I refer to as the primarchs, and and these are like when you're communicating with the greys, it's they think it, you hear it, um, but what they think. When it translates into our mind, it seems like a lot gets watered down. Um, so the closest thing was the, the mantid it, it was a primarch, like the top top dog in their hierarchy. And a lot of people have described him as being praying mantis-like. I, I think that's a fear filter that's magnifying certain features to make them appear mantis-like, but they're really not. Um, or maybe the closest they can de describe it, right? Maybe it's like, oh, it's very much like a praying man because of the head, right? Yeah, their, their head is, is larger at the top. Their eyes, you know, kind of come around right to the edge of their skull, uh, more so than the grays. Or you have the little short grays that everybody is familiar with, and then you have taller, skinnier ones. And um, their class generally translates to archons. Okay. Um, the tall and the short ones. Yeah. Um, no, just the, just the tall ones. Not the mantids, oh. but the tall, the taller than normal grays. The little grays are just drones, and as far as I know, they don't have a name. At least not one that I'm familiar with. Um, but the taller ones, the kind of intermediate ones, those are the archons, which in Greek means dark gods. And. As a child, I began to study mythology because of that contradiction of why they would be called, you know, referred to a name that's that means dark gods when there's nothing about them that seems dark or bad. In fact, you know, very much the contrary. Uh, you know, I felt nothing but love from them and for them. Uh, 
I would seek their company every chance I got. Um, when I said I was a regular abductee as a child, um, we're talking sometimes several times a week or for several days. But then later, this one night you're talking about, they took you and you saw the other side. And you even described to me at one point that they even smelled moldy. They, yeah, they smelled moldy, mildewy. Um, there were things strewn about the ship, and all the ships I were on, the gravity kind of works the same. And if you're close to the floor or close to a wall or bulkhead or close to, to a fixed surface, um, there is a feeling of, of gravity, and I think that's some sort of static or some sort of other electrical force. Um, but if you break away from the floor, um, things float. So there's junk on the floor, and there's junk floating around in the air. And the whole place just smelled dirty. It was a, a severe contrast between the ones that I knew as a child and these things. They didn't even really look the same. They looked like, you know, they, they looked degraded, you know, um, like they'd been living rough. And over the years on these next, on these future projects, I kind of learned a lot more about um, the connections between the human element, um, the reptilians who made a frequent appearance, and um, the fallen graves and what their their entire agenda was for. Um, much of what our technology goes to, what our research goes to, what our money goes to, is um, preparing for a second war between. The graves, and that's going to happen in our space, um, and we're going to be the victims of it. So, this is where we were talking previously, and you know, I'm listening to you talk, and you said here I describe the second coming. You're talking like scripture, and you said, "Yes, that's where I was wanting to kind of." hold back right i was and i said no don't hold back this you were reluctant to say it please please if that's how the story goes that's how the story goes and so much so it really does relate to various scriptures from you know periods mm -hmm. throughout our history mm -hmm. and um what i learned and what i heard out of the mouths of some of these elites you know um later in my career i i ended up uh working for one of these fraternal orders undercover originally as the uh, uh, assistant minister of finance and later the minister of finance for one of these Illuminati fraternal organizations that um, is very prominent in, you know, so-called, you know, conspiracy lore. It's not, it's not conspiracy. Well, it is conspiracy, but it's still legitimate. You know, it's a real thing. Um, so I would hear at these parties, these events, these gatherings, um, you know, before I was invited to become a member. So you're talking about you are with the elite. You are with them, having parties, working with them, and they're coming oh, yeah. to you with problems for you oh, to yeah. solve. I, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, I by this point, um, I, I'd moved into the financial world. Um, so I was working with several foreign banks, you know, um, I had clearing accounts, had massive credit lines where, you know, I could move – and arrange for a, a, an enormous amount of funding for these projects, for these people, and, um, you know, get things done for them that, that, that they needed done. So I had And when you say they, who's they? Oh, these are some of the biggest players in the world behind the scenes, not, not the public ones you know about, but um, it's hard to say without saying it. Um, Here's your chance. Well, not so many Americans, but you're talking about, um, you know, the, the royalty around the world. Um, you know, the, the big, big money people, the Rockefellers, the Rothschild families, um, you know, the uh, even the Queen of England. I, I'm not saying she ever made a presence, but her presence was felt. Um, and these people, they have an agenda. And. From their point of view, 
they're not evil people. From our point of view, they're horrible. But from their point of view, they manufacture all the food that we consume, all the cars we drive, all the products we use, all the fuel, everything. Everything in our lives is owned and supplied by them, your electricity, your water, everything. So they look at us, the masses, as a resource to be managed. And they don't even hide that fact. And pretty much every company is a human resources division, right? Your resources. And uh, so they manipulate the world, pull the strings, you know, collapse countries here, raise countries up there. It's all a means for selling product and, and um, um, selling their services. You know, keep them rich, keep the world turning. And they see it as their responsibility to manage the herd and keep the industry of the planet going. Um, so they have no conscience about what happens to us, good or bad. Um, but I spent a lot of time with them listening to how they talk, what they talk about, what they think about us. You were um, one of them. You were at the parties listening, hearing, and, and they're asking you your advice. Yes. And um, the conversation often turned towards the subject of extraterrestrials. All right. We got to take a break. So we'll stop right there. We'll see how much we can fit in. He, he's got so much information. We'll see. We'll get in as much as we can before the show is out. But we got to take a break right now. Merry Christmas to you guys. I hope uh, tonight we're giving you the gifts of knowledge that you're looking forward to and uh, only expect to get from Coast to Coast AM. Connie Claus here. More to come. Stay with us. Robert Treat. Go uh, visit him at robtreat.com and listen to him on my podcast, Connie Willis, the podcast. Uh, thank you for being here with us, trying to wrap up the last segment with as much information as Robert Treat can with a deathbed confession. His GoFundMe at the coast of coast AM.com site. If you can help him. Uh, working to raise 12000 and currently due to you guys. And thank you so much. He's at forty six ninety eight, just uh, about forty seven. And there's no time to tell everything, but he's going to do his best to uh, prioritize what he can in the coming 15 minutes here. Keep in mind, too, we have talked five to six hours ourselves on Connie Willis, the podcast. There's 22 segments just getting underway because uh, we, hey, we want to put it here on coast. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be a whole lot more because people are going to help you, Robert, and you're going to make it through here. So thank you again, being the private military government contractor and U.S. Navy special warfare veteran and sharing your story with us. So I'm going to let you go and, and do what you wanted to do. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just hit the high point since, um, you know, I, I want to get uh, as much out as possible. And, you know, hopefully I, I survive long enough where we can come back and connect the dots later. But if this is the only chance we get, then um, I want to get the high points out. And Well, the really details are on the podcast, so we got that. So that's good. Yeah, and, and there there was a lot more that we didn't get to discuss, but um, we will, we will, we will. So the, the high points are, you know, we have on one side of things, you know, the 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 initial war between the Greys, and an important piece of background information, and these are the connecting stories I'd love to tell. We just don't have time for, it, but hopefully I w we'll be able to at some point. Um, one thing I learned is there was some kind of a forerunner race, um, the first race that seeded life throughout our universe and may have done much more. Um, so between all of the, most of the races, the inhabited um, worlds and the intelligent races around our universe, not just our galaxy, but all the other galaxies, and there's hundreds of races, um, that we all share the same a communication, a connection, and a, a, a data storage upload and download tool. And this is why it all becomes so important. You know, between, you know, the Primarchs and the Fallen, um, that was just the big war that, that happened between them here um, that left behind, you know, the, the rebel graves that 
destroyed much of the uh, uh, the inner planets in our solar system that were inhabited by the uh, reptilians, so not very many of them survived. Um, they weren't a great race to begin with, but that's another story. And then you've got the humans. And the humans were a created race just like all of the others. And we're destined to evolve just like all of the others. And we will eventually reach a state where we can rival and do the things that the greys can do and that the other races can do. And the things they can do are, are so far beyond our ability to even imagine. Um, it's, it's sad how primitive we are in comparison. And you've got the greys that are like the Uber drivers, and then you've got the archons and then the primarchs. Correct. The, the greys, the, the little greys are, they're clone species, but just because they're clones doesn't mean they don't have personalities or value or, or jobs. There's um, there's no such thing as unemployment in these other races. You know, there's no such thing as money either. Um, it's you know, every being works for the you know for the collective. They all have jobs. They all have roles to fill. And you know, the uh, the archons, the taller greys, they're kind of like the middle management. You know, um, you know they they run all the, the the ongoing activities and the mantids, the primarchs, they're, you know, they're the big boss men, the CEOs. And you have the same thing on the fallen side. Only, I think they only have one primarch, you know, maybe a couple, but there's not many left here. Um, okay, same sorry to get you. you know, same with the fallen archons. The bulk of the work is done by humans um, under the direct supervision of the reptilians. And that's that's the core of you know, what what you know I've always referred to as the cabal, and it seems like a, a, a pretty good term for them for that group: the humans, the reptilians, and the fallen fallen greys. But because of that connection and our inevitable rise to the status of a spacefaring species, there's no way that the primarchs or the good greys, as you, know, you might call them are going to allow an animalistic, warlike, violent species that still argues over things like racism and politics, there is no way they're going to let us become a space-faring race. Um, the only way that we're going to be allowed to leave the confines of our solar system is if we evolve into what we should evolve into. You know, we're the only ones corrupted. Um, it seems like that the other races, they didn't have to go through what we're going through. You know, maybe it's the stock we were created out of. But the fact that humans were created out of, you know, the genetic stock that was already existing on Earth was one of the reasons there was a split between the greys in the first place. Um, the fallen greys despise humanity. They call us mud people or dirt people, dirt creatures. And that's what they think of us. We're, we're trash to them. Um, but we're going to be useful cannon fodder when the Fallen and the Primarchs go to war for a second time. You call that and the second fun. coming? Yeah, they're they're coming back here, and there's going to be another spat. And it's between you know them and uh, the Fallen, and uh, humanity is going to be drugged into it, um, along with uh, the Reptilians. Um, but the Greys, I mean, they're not warlike. They're not. It's you know, it's not that they're bloodthirsty conquerors, and it's a communication tool, right? Um, you know, when you feel things, when you experience feelings that aren't your own, they're just coming from somewhere else. That's part of it, right? Um, the more violence we consume on media, right, the more violence and division we consume in politics, right, we recreate that energy and rebroadcast it. So the world gets exponentially more violent, exponentially more um, apathetic. Right. The more we pump out horrible things and negative things, the more we pollute our own species, our own world. But we're also polluting the rest of the universe with our energy. And um, that's what's going to be stamped out. And we either turn into a species that gets beyond that finally. And, you know, it's like as it was explained to me as a child. It's not that you don't feel anger. Anger is a biochemical reaction. Boom, something happens, you're angry. But you don't stay angry. You know, same with jealousy. You can feel jealousy, but you don't dwell in the jealousy. You don't, if you're still angry or jealous five minutes after the fact, now that's a choice. 
And what they want us to do, what the good grades want us to do, and the rest of the uh, um, intelligent races out there want us to do is get to the point where we've cut those parts away from us. So it's not even a choice anymore. You get angry, but you don't stay angry, right? Um, you can experience things without dwelling in them, without fueling them, and without, without making it worse. Those of us that are capable of, you see, we're, they're more or less what we consider quantum beings, right? Um, if they think something, it begins to manifest immediately. And the higher the, higher the plane, this lack of a better term for right now, the higher the plane they are, the quicker the manifestation happens. So if they think something, it happens almost immediately. We're destined to evolve into that. And could you imagine what it would be like for a species that has no control over its mind or its emotions to have the ability to manifest those emotions or those thoughts into reality? It would be catastrophic for the entire universe to allow that to happen. So they're not going to allow it to happen. They're going to cull the herd. They've done it before. They're going to do it again. But the next time is going to be a major thing because they're going to meet resistance for the first time. And um, that will probably end in a complete obliteration. Pretty much the first shot is going to be the last shot. So one of the things that I heard out of a very, very prominent person's mouth, he was a little drunk at a party sitting at the table next to me, and he's talking about the, the, the history of things to come. Um, Don't say the first name, but say the last name. He, he was a Rockefeller. He was one of the Rockefellers. And um, he's talking about the history of things to come, right, things that hadn't happened yet, and he's talking to them about them in the past tense. Um, I've lived to see every single one of those things come true. And that night when I heard it, I thought he was just, you know, drunk talking. But no, I've seen every single thing on that list happen. The end game that he talked about was a staged alien invasion. And it was that wording that made it stick in my head so vividly. So what did he mean by staged? And I came to discover what staged is. Interesting to us. For time reasons, you've said that you've been bouncing around, and I know you want to get in as much as possible. So um, you're with the elite. You, you, we had established that was like the bad trifecta, which was the reptilian, the um, fallen grays, and then uh, the elite. And you had heard what they plan to do in the future. Uh, you found out, you realized at one point, you started putting the pieces of the puzzle together that you were helping them do these things that is so against you. They had also invited you to stay, I guess, some sort of invite for you to be there. And you had to go through an initiation, right, to be a part of them even more so. Is that right? Yeah, Um the role so that state. I was filling with this order, this uh, Illuminati order, got about um, three minutes. Yeah, you know, which is one of the one of the orders that evolved out of the Templars. Um, their minister of finance could not return for health reasons on a permanent basis, so they asked me if I would, you know, um, take that position permanently and become a part of the order. You know, um, which I agreed to, and. Uh, it came time for the, you know, the the final little ceremony that made it official. You know, you meet the Godfather. In this case, the Godfather was the Pope. And uh, when I learned, we, it was the night before we were we were going to fly to Rome, and I was being briefed on protocol. And when I was told that I would have to kiss the Pope's ring, that was the last straw. I was not doing that. You know, I don't care what the, you know, the power or the money that came with that position. I'm not kissing the Pope's ring. I, you know, already chosen my allegiances and. I wasn't going to sell out for that. And uh, that was pretty much it for me. Um, they stuck me on a plane the following morning at 7 a.m., um, got me out of there, and uh, pretty much all doors were shut to me after that. The uh, Okay. We uh, – listen, I we have to go. Thank you so much for being here. And, you know, hey – Thank you, Robert. Got to say goodbye to you. You can hear more at Connie Willis, the podcast. We do have more segments, like 22 segments uh, of his story. So robtreat.com um, is where you can also see where he is and go to his GoFundMe. In the meantime, you guys have a great Christmas and a holiday season. 
Thanks so much for being with us. I'm Connie Willis. Jerry Wills with us earlier and Robert Treat too. Be, be sure to go to our website. You can learn how to reach each one of them. Uh, I want to thank all the people that help out here and make this happen on Coast to Coast. Julie Talbot, Bill May, Lisa Lyon, Tommy Danheiser, Dan Galani, Stephanie Smith, Mike Cosio, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDesseur, Tim Banal, Gina Salvati, Donna Walker, Adam Thompson, Jeremiah Harris, Ryan Stacy, Chris Burroughs, Ian Punnett, Lisa Gar, Richard Sirrett, George Knapp, and of course, George Nori, the entire Coast to Coast AM team. George Nori, 20 years in January, you guys. All right. From the foothills of the Colorado Rockies, many thanks. And until we meet again, join me at ConnieWillis.com. The podcast will give you more segments and more details of what Robert was here for tonight. Keep watching the night skies and continue with me to seek out the strange and uncover the unknown. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. From Coast to Coast AM, I'm Connie Willis. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.